I was thinking as they were si as they were singing, um, our musicians, everybody has either started to go to Memphis uh, for convocation, and we have a couple of people that's on vacation. But I was thinking as they were singing, I, uh, Elder Kenny, sometimes if you, you got a girlfriend and she go away, she better she better not stay away too long, cause you beat and got somebody else. Or you mean I got you mean I got used to her being gone, <laughs> and she called on the phone and said, "Oh, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Oh, I was wondering if you missed me. Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he said, well, "Maybe you should, baby, you should stay gone. <laughs> I don't know, but we love the Lord on today. God is good to us. Where uh, we are so ecstatic, we are ecstatic. We are glad." This is the day that the Lord has made, and we're going to do what? We're going to rejoice and be glad. And no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening, no matter what's happening in our life, no matter what the obstacle is, we have made a choice that we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. No matter what nobody else is doing, no matter what nobody else is saying, I have chosen to rejoice and be glad. No, what I'm facing, no matter what trouble is coming, no matter what the affliction, no matter what's going on in my body and my mind, I have made the choice to rejoice and be glad in it. Because you know it's hard to rejoice and complain at the same time. You're going to have to do one or the other. You're going to have to come from to one side or the other. And I choose to rejoice. Complaining don't do me no good. Complaining about the problem, complaining about what's going on, complaining about how much money I don't have, complaining about what I don't have and what I can't do is not going to help me. So I might as well, look at somebody and tell them, say, you might as well rejoice. Because see, if you rejoice, God just might do something for me. He might just move. God just might move. If I lift him up, if I glorify him, if I give him praise, he just might. He just might come through for me. He just might do something. He might just do the extraordinary for me. If I would just lift him up. God is in the extraordinary business. God believes in doing extraordinary things. You serve a big God. You serve an extraordinary God. God do the things outside of the norm. Uh, he doesn't do the typical things. He go outside. He wait till it's almost. He he do. He has the Lazarus effect. He don't wait till the problem is going on while you talk about the problem. He wait till the situation is dead and say, "Okay, is there no hope? Is there anything too hard for God this morning?" He wait till there's no hope. He don't wait till you're about to lose the job. He wait till the job is over with, and they say you can't come back no more, and they escort you out of the building. God said, okay, now it's time for me to move. He wait till the lights get cut off, and then he be, somebody don't like that. He wait till the water get cut off, and then he say, okay, now I'm going to move and show you that I am God, that I am able, that I'm able to do. The extraordinary, I keep hearing that word this morning, the extraordinary. Yes, yes, that's what, that's what we need. Now, the ordinary, some the songs say the ordinary just won't do. I need more than that. I need more than that today. I need more than that on this week to make it. I'm going to need something more than the ordinary. I'm going to need something that's going to lift me up. And we hope today that you'll be lifted up and that we can say something or do something that will help you know that you can make it on next week. I don't know what you was told. I, I don't know how you feel when you came here, but I'm come to let you know that you can make it. 
you can make it on next week. Don't throw in a towel. Don't give up. Don't quit. Tell somebody, say, don't quit, because you can make it. I'm sure you can make it because I made it. Didn't feel like I was going to make it, but I did anyhow. I wanted to give up, wanted to throw in a towel, but God said, no, hold on just a little while longer. And I love the Lord. God had been so good to me. If I had a thousand tongues, I couldn't praise him enough. Let's go to the scriptures. We're going to read a few scriptures on today, and uh, then we're going to let you go. Randy, check the machine and make sure its software is updated on that. And uh, I see Chris with his thumb up, so I'm guessing. Chris, uh, can y'all get back there, Brother Zach? Can you get the 27th chapter of Psalms? The 27th chapter of Psalms. The 27th chapter of Psalms, if you could. Get it to me in, uh, we'll, let's go ahead and do the King James, but we may switch that over. Uh, I, and I may do something that's atypical or something that I'd never do. Um, because it misses some of the nuances of the scriptures. Uh, I may read one of those scriptures out of the Message Bible. I don't typically do that because it, you know, it, it's a, a, I don't want to say a lesser version of the trans, it's a translation, so thank you. It's a translation thing for me with the Message Bible, but it has some good points. It has some good points. And when I want to go back to, you know, when I want to go back to the, the real thing, I go to, to the King James Version because it gives me what I need and it speaks to me. All right, Psalm the 27th chapter, and this is in the King James Version, and I'll go ahead and read it. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength or the backbone or the thing that I depend on of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Now, when it says of whom shall I be afraid, it's, it says in the Message Bible, it says I should be afraid of no one and nothing. No one and nothing. So it's not just a person. We shouldn't be afraid of no one and nothing because God is on our side. We got the big God. You got the big G. The little G is in this world doing his thing. Like yesterday when y'all saw the old boy get shot, the little G, the little G is doing little things and, and things is happening, but the big G is on the throne. And that's what matters. Verse 2, it says, when the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came up on me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. So I have enemies that I, I some of them are, some are known and some are unknown. Sometimes, and I, and I told y'all this before, a person can be a foe, which means an adversary that could just be against what you're doing. See, that's why you got to make sure you always got God on your side. See, because people are not going to always agree with you. People can be saved and still be a foe. I didn't find that out until I got in March of Faith. I started dealing with the people. And I found out that it wasn't, it, it wasn't that they was just against you. You got people that just don't like you. Now, you may not want to own up to it. You got people, uh, Pastor William, that just can't get along with you. Somebody else do something that's okay. But they just don't like you. Uh-huh. Yeah, see? And I, I, know, I know that's a shock. That's a shock to you because a lot of us want to be loved. And you like Pastor Darvell for everybody. You, want, you just don't understand. I'm a good person. And, you know, I try to do people right. I try to do people right. And I'm a good person. And I don't understand why they, they just don't like you. Your eyes is too close together. Your hair may be too big. Your wig, you don't wear your wig on straight. They just don't like you, and you might as well just own up to it. Live with it. Look at somebody and say, live with it. Because as long as you live, Elder Goldie, you're going to have somebody that don't like what you're doing, don't like what you're saying, don't like what you did. But whose side we on this morning? We on the Lord's side. I'm on the Lord's side. 
And see, as long as I find myself on the lower side, it don't matter who the foe is, who the enemy is. Now, the enemy is different. The enemy want to see you dead. The enemy want to see you completely out of the picture. The enemy want to see you wiped out. Now, I know that's really bad for some of y'all. It's like, what? Why would they just want to see me wiped out? Why would they want to see me gone? I don't understand it. And I'm going to tell this little story, and then I'm going to keep reading, because I got a lot of verses here that I want to read. I was, uh, when I first went, well, I wasn't first in, I had been in the real estate business maybe about five years. And uh, I started building buildings all over, big buildings all over the place. And um, this lady was working for the city of Carbondale, and she began to send out flyers around top town telling people not to support me. I didn't know her. I didn't know why she was doing it. I couldn't understand it. She was working for the city, which is a breach. Of, she's, you're not supposed to do it. If you work for the city and there's people in the community doing stuff, you're not supposed to speak against it while they, you working for the city. And they was letting it go on. And I couldn't understand it. And I was thinking in my mind, I, I said, well, Lord, I said, I'm the only black person doing anything. The rest of these people ain't doing nothing. And then when you try to do something, you got people from the city fighting you. And I said, well, God, what, what's, what's the problem? And so she kept fighting, and then after she, the Lord didn't let it stop. Pastor Darvell, I said, well, Lord, I ain't going to worry about it. You're going to get them, and blah, blah, blah. No, that's not what happened, folks. The Lord allowed it to go on. And allowed it to, you know, every time something would come up, like I would have something come before the uh, services board, she would tell them to fight it. <laughs> I said, oh, my God, what is happening? I don't even know her. I ain't done nothing to her. And so then there was a, another lady at the city. She called me on the phone. She said, this lady just don't like you. She jealous. She, that's why she fighting you. She said, but you got this other thing coming up, and she going to try to fight you, but this is what I want you to do. And so I did what the lady told me to do. This other lady told me to do, and I got the win. See, God will always give you the win. See, God, God always got somebody on your side. I don't care how crooked people get. I don't care how many tricks they try to play and how many traps they try to set. God always got somebody. God always got somebody to give you the little inside to let you know, hey, they about to cut your lights off. Here, go and do this and take care of this, and I'm going to take care of this for you. See, God is when God is on your side, he's more than the world against you. So it says here, it says, when the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came upon me, the sea be destroyed. They stumbled and fell, though a host should encamp, or there's a hope, a host encamping. A host is when you get a whole group of people. <laughs> Some of y'all got a whole group of people that's just sitting, waiting in the valley for you to come like Goliath was waiting on David. Come on out, Delisha. Where you at? I know you're down there. Elder Eddie, you say you've been praying on Friday. Come on out. I'm waiting on you. I come down here to eat of your skull. You know, that's what they used to do. You know, to bust your head and then let the bees put honey in and then they eat out your skull and carry your sword around and all that old kind of crazy stuff. Feel like we're going back to that. You know, come on down here. Don't bring nobody, just me and you, one-on-one. -on -one. You got to let them know. But listen, when I come, the Lord is coming too. I ain't been praying for nothing. I ain't been fasting for nothing. I ain't been talking to God for nothing. When I come, Jesus is coming with me. So I may have to go in the closet and cry right now, but when I come out, tell somebody, say, when I come out. When I come out, I'm coming out with my hands up. I'm coming out with the victory sign. Hallelujah. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart, or I don't have to lose heart. I don't have to faint. I don't have to give up. The war should rise against me. In this will I be confident or satisfied or uh, confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after. 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord. I'm going to dwell in the house. I'm going to dwell in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to dwell under his wings. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord. See? Because there's safety in the presence of the Lord. Let me tell you something. And I don't know if they're taping or not, but I got a place where I live. I used to live at 12 Pine Lake Drive. And then I lived at 25 Pine Lake Drive. And when I was living at 25 Pine Lake Drive, that's where I would dwell, but I didn't have to stay there. I had a choice. I had a choice. If I wanted to leave there, I could walk out of the house anytime I wanted to. Y'all going to miss something. I'm going to take you there. You can dwell with the Lord anytime you want to. But you can walk out of the door whenever you get ready. But then you need to ask yourself, do I need to walk out of the door? Do I need to be out there, Pastor Darvell? Do I need to be out of the presence of the Lord? Or do I need to take him with me everywhere I go? Because see, when you get from up under his presence, you're out of his protection. See, and he had to tell you, come on, get back on. Come on back over here. I'm over here. Don't go out the, don't go out the door. Dwell in my presence. Dwell right here and you'll be all right. You can keep your mind straight now. See, some of us, our mind can't get straight now. And our mind get all twisted up because we move out of his presence or we don't dwell in his presence. But we have to dwell, somebody say dwell, in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, his beauty is his attributes. His attributes. When you see somebody's beauty, the, their beauty tells you what attributes they have. You say, oh, you got nice eyes. Oh, you got nice ears. Oh, you got beautiful teeth. And, you know, well, what's the best thing about me? Well, what's the best thing about God? It depends on who you ask. Because for all of us, he's different things. It depends on what we need at the time. See, and then when you dwell in his presence, what you can do is you can see the beauty of the Lord. His, the or, what came to my mind was the orderliness. How orderly God, how God does things in order. You know, it's a beautiful thing to see things done in order. And I know y'all, a lot of y'all not basketball fans. Some of y'all might be, but when you watch a play take place and you watch the man pass one ball to this person and you, and you know already because you can tell what order it's supposed to go in, the ball, Elder William, go to another person and then you know it's like, okay, this guy standing outside, they're going to pass it to him and he's going to shoot. That's how God is. God has an order in the way he does things. Yes, it may look in disarray at first, but then if you watch the order of God, God has a way. He has a way of doing, and there is a beauty in the things that God, the way he orders things, how he uh, orchestrates things. It says, I may be uh, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire or ask, Lord, what you want me to do from here in his temple? Where you want me to go? Huh? Where you want me to be at in this, this play, God? Well, show me what to do next, Lord. Show me what to do in my life. Show me what to do with my finance. Show me what to do in my relationships. Show me. And if I'm in his presence, I can ask questions. See, it's good to ask questions. My dad used to always say, he said, if I don't, if I don't know, I'm going to ask questions. And then he would say, Mother Love, he would say, I'm going to keep asking questions. He would say, I'm going to keep asking questions until I get an understanding. And he wasn't ashamed. See, some of us like to play like we know. See, and that's the worst place to be in in the world. When you play like you know and you don't know, you get everybody messed up. See, in this world that you're living in, you got to be for sure. That you know, that you got to understand, okay, and all they're getting out of the words, they get an understanding, so I need to just get understanding. You said go across the street. Some things can seem simple, you know? Some things can seem so simple. You can tell, I got my grandson, Trey, Rel, Sorrell uh, C, uh, Jr. says he, the way he focused, you know, you can tell him something, and then 
Five seconds later, he done forgot. He on his phone. He on his phone doing whatever he doing. Y'all got kids. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You can say, go take the trash out. I'm, I'm going to go show you. Go, Junior, go take the trash out. You go on about your business, going to do whatever you going to do, and you come back, look, there the trash is. Still there, filling up. Junior, what did I tell you? Didn't I tell you go take the trash out? Well, he done got distracted. He done got sidetracked. He thinking about something else. That's what happened with us. The Lord say, do X and Y. Pastor Cosette, he said, didn't I tell you to do X and Y? And then the devil sent all these distractions. People, well, uh, my cousin called me, and he needed $30 for gas. And uh, X and X, Y, and this happened. The Lord said, didn't I tell you what was important? Do what I told you first. All the rest of that stuff can wait. You see about your cousin later. Don't worry about them. They always need gas. They always need something. Don't worry. Don't worry about your daughter. She always need. She always wants something. Don't worry about that. She ain't gonna go nowhere. Do what I told you to do first, and then come back. So it says here, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion or in his safety. I'm under uh, what I like to call a protective custody. I'm in protective custody. Yeah. So you can try to do whatever you want to to me. But see, just like yesterday, I got people around me. I got them angels yeah. around me so that when something happened, Mother Jan, you think you finna get to me, but you're not. You say, man, he right there. And if I could get him, he right there. And then them angels say, oh, no, you can't. You can't get this one. And you can't get that one because that one belonged to me. So you're going to have to stand back. The angels is telling the devil to stand back on somebody this morning. He trying to get you. He want to get you. You know, and we, we so silly sometimes. We don't even know where we at. You know, I had a cousin. I told y'all my cousin. We used to steal bikes. And he said, get on the bike. He said, now I'm going to get that one. And you get this one. He said, now when you get on it, you just ride. He said, don't stop, don't turn around, don't look to see where I am. And he said, I'll meet you back at the house. And so I would get on the bike and just ride. I ain't had no business. My mom and daddy could buy bikes and stuff if I wanted. I'm just silly. You just silly. Doing silly stuff, doing dumb stuff. See? He said, for in the, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up on the rock, or he'll put me under his protection. I don't have to worry about what's happening around me because God is my protection. See, and if you're not careful, some of these people out here try to get you. Somebody after you right now, and you don't even know. Somebody hates you right now, and you don't even know it. you just dancing around, yeah. And they are ready to get you. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. So I'm at, uh, uh, lifting up sacrifices of joy to the Lord. Because of everything that he has done for me. He has made my enemies to shut up. And I thought about it the other day. Bishop... Uh, Bishop had a lot of enemies. My dad had a lot of enemies when he was the whole when he was in Michigan. They hated him in Michigan. They hated him in Michigan. They used to hate to see him coming because he was right next to Bishop, Bishop Brooks. And he would do whatever Bishop Brooks said. He was right there. If he had to, to leave work and Bishop Brooks said leave work and come be down to church or whatever, he was there. And the people was like, hey, they hated that. They just hate it, and it didn't, it didn't make sense. Of course you should follow the leader. It didn't make sense, amen? It's you should follow the leader. Is that, I'm in the right place. Am I in the right place today? <laughs> Nobody said nothing. They was like, oh, wait, hold up. I thought I lost y'all for a minute. <laughs> Let me see who am I looking at. Now, if he, if he ain't right, 
if the man ain't right, if the man or woman is not right, then I understand. And you, you know, then you may want to think about it. But you better think long and hard because you better make sure that he's wrong. That's a whole nother something. That's a, that's a whole nother something. But they, he had many enemies. But you know what I found? Even when he came down here, and I thought about the time I have spent down here, been down here 40 years, over 40 years now. I've been in Carbondale. And this church had been fought and fought and fought. It's a little bit better now, but when they first came here, uh, Sister Cosette might have been, I don't know if Sister Cosette was here yet or not, here in Carbondale. But they used to say, oh, don't go over there. They practicing hoodoo. They practicing hoodoo over there, and that man is laying hands on people, and they falling out, and, you know, they practicing hoodoo over here. And my dad would just feed it, you know, he, he didn't care. You know, he, he just, he just, Bishop didn't care. You know, he was just feeding into all the haters and just, and I'd be cringing, you know, because he'd be like, I'm going to pray for you right now. <laughs> he would wait till somebody come from another church. As a matter of fact, the Muslim man came from down the street. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? See, I've been here too long. The Muslim guy came from down the street to a service, he told the Muslim man, come up here, let me pray for you. <laughs> come here, come here, let me pray for you. See, and so whenever he would face the enemy, he never worried about it. He said, see, I never worry about those people. He said, because God, gonna, God takes care of everything. And all of the enemies he faced, they either, with him, when he had Bishop Brooks faced the enemy, when Bishop, my dad faced the enemy, whenever they faced, Bishop Senior, my grandfather, when he faced him, man, the man that put the electricity in this church, all these lights, not these lights here, but the ones, the old lights that we had to have torn out, he faked, the man was trying to trick my grandfather, and he was wiring the church up the wrong way. He was wiring the wires backwards so that they wouldn't work. And my dad came down here and caught him, and he went to my Grandfather, he said, he said, Daddy, that's what he called. He said, Daddy, that man down there um, trying to trick you. He wind that stuff up wrong so you can't get in that church. And, and my grandfather said, oh, okay, it's going to be all right. And so they got rid of the man because he was, the man was an elder in one of the church in my, one of my grandfather's churches. They got, they got rid of that man and got another guy, and he came and put everything in. That man went and did some electric somewhere else not too long after that and burned up. Burnt up most of his body. Got burnt up. All of those people that my dad faced and my grandfather faced and Bishop Brooks faced, all those bishops that I served, they either dead, got sick, or something happened to them. So you never go, you never go against God's men. You always go the other way. Do, do something else. Do something. Don't talk again. Just leave him alone. If, that's, if God got his hand on him, you go, okay, all right, well, I'm just going to let you move on down the road, but let me move out your way. And you just move on. I just threw that in. That was free. All right. Then it says here, I'm almost done. It says, and he shall, uh, uh, my head will be lifted up above my enemies. Therefore, will I offer sacrifices of joy, and I will sing, yay. I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Lord, hear me. Have mercy on me also upon me and answer me. When thou didst say, when thou sayest, seek ye my face, my heart, and unto thee thy face, Lord, will I seek. Lord, when the Lord tell you to seek him, seek him. We having a consecration coming up uh, down to the uh, convention. Oh, I'm a, they not, it's not on Facebook. I was so, they had all of these things at the convocation that they wanted to do, and they, we was in the executive board meeting, and, and, and they had all of these things that they wanted to do. And then I kept remembering what my mother said. She said, whenever these people start cutting up, or whenever you had a, a lot of problem out of people, take them in consecration. <laughs> 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 Mother would say, cut the food off. 
Whenever they st these people start clowning and cutting up, she said, cut the food off. Shut the, shut the food, cut the food off and shut off the water. No water and no food. That would give them a whole new focus. That's why when she would have a consecration, she didn't want people coming from the outside that was eating, coming in, you know, just doing stuff. Because the rest of the people, they wouldn't be eating. So their focus would be completely different than that person that was coming in. They coming off the street with all loaded down with all them problems and all them situations and who they mad at at the church and all of that. Uh-uh. You don't even be thinking about that when you ain't eating. That don't come to you if you ain't in the eight and long enough. If long enough time pass by, you ain't worried about who you ain't worried about who you hate at the church. You ain't worried about who been looking at you cross-eyed. None of that cross your mind. All you can think about is, ooh, Jesus. When this gonna be? Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> ain't no TV on, and then we wasn't no phones. See, y'all got a phone now where y'all can look at your phone whenever you get ready to. It wasn't no phones and stuff. See, all of that stuff was out. See, and all you had to focus on was your, your stomach making that noise. <laughs> Praise the Lord anyhow. I'm almost done. And it says here in verse 9, it says, Hide thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Lord, don't be mad at me. Thou hast been my help. Lord, you helped me. I wasn't going to make it, God. I had gave up on my own self. I wasn't going to make it, God, but you helped me. I didn't deserve it, Lord, but you helped me. I wasn't worthy, God, but you helped me. Then it says here, it says, lead, lead me not. Don't leave me now, Lord, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. This is one of my favorite verses, verse 10. It says, when my mother, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. It don't mean that they, his mother and father didn't, didn't want to help them. If they could, they might have been dead at this time because this is David talking. But it says that when they forsake him, then the Lord will take you up. The Lord will take up a responsibility for you. When your mother and father's gone, when everybody's out of the picture, the Lord will take up responsibility for you. Somebody feel, walked in here and felt like they was all alone. Somebody walked in here this morning, and you feel like you all alone, that you don't have no help, that you don't have nobody on your side. I got news for you. That's not the truth. This scripture here says that when, the, when your mother and father forsake you, and you know you, you typically your mother and father is actually supposed to be the closest to you, whoever your mother and father uh, figures are, are the, that God gave you, they're usually the closest to you, but even when they can't help you, God is there for you. The Lord will take you up. The Lord will help you. When you, get in a, when you have a problem that you can't solve and you can't get your mama or your daddy or your stepmama, or none of them on the phone, you can't text them. You're texting people. Sometimes you text people and they be in a meeting. So they really can't text you. You, you know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Sometimes when you text it and you're in a meeting, especially if you're the person up talking, I get texts sometimes while I'm sitting up here and, and, and things come across. I was in, when I was in Europe, Bishop Rejay sent me a thing. He said, I got an emergency. I need you to, to, to um, call me as soon as you can. <laughs> what the message said, y'all, it says, I know you are on vacation. <laughs> when they start out like that, <laughs> just, just saying when they start out like that, you know what's going left. He says, I know you are on vacation, but I have an emergency and I need you to give me a call as soon as you can. I'm like, oh, man. So I pick up my phone. First lady said, what you doing? What you doing? I was like, no, I, gotta, I, gotta, I got to do this. I said, Bishop, read your call. I, you know, I, got, I, got, I need to answer this. I need to figure out what's going on. So I called. And then typically if she say that, if I'm on speakerphone, I can't talk to them for her talking. Because she need all the, the details. <laughs> I'm a surface guy. I'm a surface guy. She a detail person. Give me the details of what you're talking about. How deep is this, how deep is this situation that we got to take care of? So it says that when my mother and father forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. I'm still reading. Teach me, teach me, Lord, how you operate. 
and lead me in a plain path. Don't y'all know it's a lot of crooked paths out here? That's why we need a light because of my enemies. And it's an enemy in every crooked path. There's a dead end everywhere. Deliver me not until the will of my enemies. For false witnesses are risen up against me and such as breathe out cruelty. Cruelty. You got people just saying stuff. My wife received a message the other day on her phone. We don't know where it came from. We, that happened to us all the time. We get messages. I got, I have a, y'all don't know this, but I'm going to tell y'all a secret. Everybody send me a dirty letter. Send me something saying, you know, oh, I hate you. Why did you do that? Or you shouldn't have did this. And all of them dirty, the nasty letters that people have sent, that some of the people that done left here, Guess what? I keep them all. I don't throw nothing. I don't throw nothing away. I don't throw nothing away. Every lawsuit that I got, I still got all the paperwork from every lawsuit, Elder Eddie, that I'd ever had. And I got a bunch of them. I had a bunch of them. Most of them was not my fault. It's nothing that I did. People saw some money and felt like, hey, we're going to get that guy because he got money. And my lawyer said, you might as well pay him. Because by the time you get through paying me, you're going to might as well just give him a few dollars and see if you can settle the thing. Y'all don't know how that, some of y'all don't know how that feels. Pastor William, you ain't got that. You don't know how that feels yet where you walk up and it's a $50,000 thing and the person say, well, you might as well just give them 20 For what? It's not. <laughs> For what? Give them 20 for what? They ain't did nothing. And I didn't do anything. And he'll say, well, I understand that, but if we go to court, then he says a 50-50 chance. What you talking about a 50-50 chance? Ain't no 50-50 chance. I didn't do nothing. He said, well, you might as well see if they take 10. 10 for what? 10 of what? I gotta get I gotta get the ten from some from take it from somewhere to give it to them, and then you see them after you give it to them, gotta keep them just riding around. You gotta watch them riding around on your ten. I, last thing, and then I'm gonna got five minutes, and I think I told y'all this before. The one lady sued us, Well, she didn't actually sue us. She was suing first lady. I was just put it out. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't sue us. She sued First Lady. First Lady hadn't. First, let, I got. Let me. I got to tell this story. I'm a, I'm, yes. First Lady hadn't done nothing to this lady. As a matter of fact, the lady came to First Lady and said, "I don't have no place to stay, and I got a disabled child, a uh, grand person, or whatever." Can you please, like, give me a house? She said, for first lady, said, well, I got two places, I think, at that time open. Let me show them to you, and then uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens. Show the lady place. Long story short, got ready. She said, so first lady said, all you need is, like, first month's rent and a deposit or whatever. Guess what? I don't have no deposit, and I don't have no money. I don't have none. So first lady said, well, let me see. Let me talk to my husband and see. She came home, talked to me. I said, well, you know, this your thing. Whatever you do, that's what will be done. So Pastor Darvell, she goes and lets the lady go ahead. Now, this ain't the first time she would do that, do this. God, how many times she had done that, I, I can't even tell you. Let the lady move in. The lady didn't have no money. She, she said, okay, well, you... Pay your deposit over time, and we'll break it up, and this and that. And so then uh, she let the lady move in. The lady had been there two or three months, and then uh, I think some kind of way we end up getting some paperwork from a lawyer saying, this person is suing you. We said, oh, what? What you mean they suing us? They owe us money. <laughs> they can't be suing. They can't. And how did they get the money to sue without no money? Well, come to find out. This was what this person did. That was what their occupation was, was to go and get a place, 
and sue the people. And I told the lawyer, I said, well, I ain't giving them. We went to go see a lawyer because I keep a lawyer. But I ain't giving them nothing. She said, listen. And her name is Christine. That's my lawyer. She said, listen, it's better off if you just give them the money. Give them some money. I said, oh, my God, you got to be kidding. She said, well, it's my understanding. I've talked to the people around me in, the, in the, my community, my law community. And what I've discovered is this is what she does. She goes around and sues people and, you know, t- typically people like you. <laughs> And what the people do is they settle. I'm like, oh, no, we're not doing that. I'm going to court. Forget that. She was like, well, when you get out of court, you're going to probably be out of many more thousands because we got all this stuff that we got to do. And I said, oh, my God. So anyway, long story short, we settled with the lady. And first lady, the lady got a job working out here at Dillard's. Was it Dillard's? Macy's. Oh, see, he remember. <laughs> he remember. She got a job out here, y'all working at Macy's. And I would wonder why every time first lady come from the mall, she be looking cross-eyed. What's wrong with you? She working at Macy's. You done gave her the money. You done gave that lady the money, and now every time you go in the store, you got to look in her face and like, these people beat me out of my money. <laughs> this is terrible. And so she had to face that for years. Until she finally went and told her, she said, you know what, I'm going to tell that lady I forgive. Then you went in there and told that lady, you said, you know, I forgive you. And after she did that, everything changed. She had a different demeanor. She was able to continue on. But that was three, I think it was three years. So some of y'all may be in that spot right now where you holding something against somebody. That don't go away overnight. That's understandable, but don't die like that. Look at somebody, tell them, say, don't die like that. Don't you die like, don't you die like that. Don't you die with that in your heart. It said, deliver me not over until the will of my enemies for false witness against, rose against me. That's going to happen all the time. And, and such as breathe out cruelty, I have fainted. I would have gave up if I hadn't seen, the, David said he would have gave up the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. While I was living, I would have gave up. Last verse, wait, somebody say wait. wait, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, wait on the Lord, march of faith, and be of good courage, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord to deliver you, wait on the Lord to bring you out, wait on the Lord to do it for you. Some things may take 10 years, 15 years, 3 years, 5 years, 20 years, 30 years. I waited on one thing for God to do, it took 20 years. For God to do something for me. And I was like, oh, my God, am I going to have to keep going through this? Lord, why is this happening to me? I'm doing everything you said do. Why am I going through this? This has been 20 years, Lord. And after 20 years, God brought me. He brought me out of this thing that I was dealing with. And I knew it was him that did it. It could have only been him. He was the only one that could do it. And it took 20 years for him to do it. But when he did it, it was like, boom, you out. This is over. That thing is over. This is over with. This situation is over with. This is moved. For some of y'all, y'all thinking, oh, well, I got to go through this step and then do this and then do that to get out. No, God can say, boom, over with. Trial over with. You pass the test. Things is over with. I move on to the next thing. Then it's going to be something else. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Don't give up. And he shall strengthen thy heart. Somebody want to quit today. If I had a message today and if it had a subject, it would be don't quit. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't stop. Keep going. Keep moving. And if you can't keep moving, march in in place. (laughs) Mother Jan, they don't know nothing about that. If you can't keep moving, march in place. Just keep my, oh, yeah, I'm coming. I can't move right now, but I'm coming. Oh, don't worry about it. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep my feet moving until we can move forward. And when the Spirit says, forward, you know what time it is, devil. I'm going to put something across your head. Here we go. 
Keep moving. Keep moving. Don't stop. Don't give up on God. Because he definitely have not given up on you. Stand to your feet. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord this morning. Wait on the Lord and don't quit. Don't give up. The Lord is your life. The Lord is your strength. The Lord is your backbone. I know you want to give up. I know you want to throw in a towel. If you've been listening on YouTube or listening by Facebook, if you've been listening by YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Push that little button that says subscribe. It's in red. And what uh, other thing that I would like to say to you, like we always say, have faith in God. Father God, we magnify you. Hello, family. We would like to thank you for your continued charitable support. If you would like to sow into the Mark to Faith Community Church, please note the following ways to give. One, mail contributions to P.O. Box 999, Carbondale, Illinois, 62903. Two, cash app to Midwest SG. Three, Venmo to Midwest SG. Thank you again and may God bless you.